Good morning. Good to see all of you. We are still in Mark chapter 12. In, we begin in verse 35 today. Mark 12, verse 35. And look at this. Karen and Grant are here. Even though I warned you, the first 15, 20 minutes will be a rerun. But uh, no, that's... that's uh, you've already forgotten it. Okay. And I've got this annoying microphone cord. I can't keep it in the pocket. All right, here we go, here we go. Yes, yes. All right, uh, let's open with prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your love and for your care. We now ask you that by the power of your word, you would strengthen us in the faith and that you would help us better to know your love for us through your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Jesus has been in the temple nonstop since 11, verse 26. Uh, he's been there. He's been questioned by the leadership of Jerusalem, the elders, chief priests, and scribes. He has uh, dealt with... Um, the, the Pharisees and the Herodians asking him, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or is it right to pay taxes to Caesar? He's dealt with the Sadducees who have asked him about the resurrection, setting up that crazy <coughs> hypothetical where the woman is married to seven different men over the course of her life and to whom is she married in heaven. And then finally, last week, we had the scribe who came up to him and asked, which is the greatest commandment? Also in the mix is his parable of the wicked tenants who keep killing or running off the servants that the owner of the vineyard sends to collect his rent, and that the, the, the leaders perceived that the parable was about them. Uh, and even before that, uh, them asking him uh, by whose authority he does these things, namely cleanse the temple. And he puts to them the question, uh, uh, from whom was uh, the baptism of John, uh, heaven or man, God or man? And, and they wouldn't answer him, so he didn't answer them. So all, all, all of that is, is uh, set up for uh, verse 35 and following, where having outwitted, we might say, his opponents, uh, sent them away in such a way that, uh, in verse 34, no one dared to ask him any more questions. After he so deftly handled all the challenges put to him, and then the marvelous way in which he answered the scribe, the scribe who, unlike perhaps, uh, perhaps unlike the the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians, comes sympathetically. He, he admires Jesus. He appreciates the, the answer Jesus had just given to the Sadducees regarding the resurrection. He asks in sincerity, which is the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, uh, mind and strength, and, and love your neighbor as yourself. And uh, the, 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 the final word, uh, you're not far from the kingdom of God. Um, but, but now, all that having taken place... Jesus is going to turn the tables and put a question to them. And something's buzzing. Is that me? Is that... I, see, I get nervous because if my phone's buzzing, we'll lose the recording, the, the Zoom. Okay, it, it's, it's still working. Okay. All right. Am I, am I hearing things? It's those gnats. <laughs> <laughs> Who's laughing? The first service people. Because... Uh, they, they know we had the Exodus reading where uh, it was gnats and flies. Uh, yes. Um, Jesus' comment that, um, to the scribe that you're not far from, I know you spoke to that last week, but I've slept since then. Ah, okay. <laughs> well, I, I, I think, well, in, in the whole context of the gospel, 
I, I think at the very least, you're not far from the kingdom of God, has to be heard as something of a compliment. It, it is a favorable thing for Jesus to have said in this regard, that the scribe, unlike the Pharisees especially, who, who we know from chapter, chapter uh, s- 7, remember chapter 7, where they, the Pharisees and the scribes complain because Jesus and his disciples don't engage in all the extra ritual cleansings that they do. Ritual cleansings that aren't even prescribed in the Old Testament. Things above and beyond what God himself commanded in the Old Testament. But remember, the Pharisees are especially concerned with purity. And they're going to go the extra mile so as to, I guess, accelerate the Messiah's coming. Because why are they still in exile? Because they're sinful. And so we're going to we're going to make, be extra careful about not being sinful. And, and, and we're going to, you know, if, 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 even, if a Gentile even makes eye contact, I'm going to wash my hands afterwards, that kind of thing. And so what, what, what does Jesus do? He says, look, it's not the stuff you put in you that makes you unclean. It's the stuff that comes out of you. It's your heart. You're already unclean in your heart. And so enough of this obsession with external things. Uh, You've got a much bigger problem, a heart problem. And and, and notice, look, um, so so in uh, uh, chapter 7, beginning in verse um, 15, 15, he he, he tells the people this after he's addressed his opponent's Specifically, now he's going to tell the, the whole people this in their hearing. There's nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart but his stomach? and is expelled, you know, nice on the ESV. It's literally and goes into the latrine in the Greek. And and notice the the parenthetical here. Uh, Mark writes, thus he declared all foods clean. This is fresh on my mind because I've I've finished up the sermon for Wednesday on Leviticus. (laughs) And and, and so I I begin by by, uh, sort of entertaining the objections to, to even giving Leviticus the time of day given that so little of it applies to us anymore. Look, all all those unclean, clean distinctions which make up a good quarter of the book of Leviticus, in one fell swoop, Jesus says no longer apply. Uh, The kosher stuff's gone now that Christ has come. Um, and, And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him, for from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, Adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. So, the scribe, by assenting to Jesus saying, look, there there is a hierarchy. There is something far more important than uh, defiling yourself by, by eating a lobster. It's giving your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength to God. The scribe gets this in a way that the Pharisees don't. They're still stuck on the external matters. He gets that it's a matter of the heart, that God is demanding our whole being. In that way, he's not far. And so that, insofar as, as he gets that in a way, his fellow scribes and the Pharisees don't, we should read it as, as a good thing to, to have been told. And yet, he's not far from, and yet not in. He's not far from, but he's not actually in. What, 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 what's, what's he missing? Yeah, what, 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 he, what he's missing is, is the fact that, that he can't do this. 
he can't give himself wholly to God. His, his sin is, is that total. And, and that, that someone else must do this for him, must make this wholeheartedness possible. Um, and, and you could even read it as a, as a kind of double entendre in that you're not far from the kingdom of God is actually literally true because the kingdom of God is staring him in the face. The kingdom of God is the one talking to him. Jesus brings in his person the rule and reign, the gracious rule and reign of God. You're not far from the kingdom of God. But do you realize that? <laughs> uh, do you get that you're not far? Yeah, that might in fact be exactly what he was referring to. That yeah. Standing in front of him. See, I think it's, it's both. I, I, I think it's that, that he's going to go home and think about it. But part of, part of the scribe's problem, part, part of the exchange that, that, that I think as we read it, we go, yes, yes, oh, is, is where the scribe tells Jesus he got it right. <laughs> you, you, you see, that's not <laughs> humble faith before your Lord and Savior. Uh, you, you don't judge Jesus, you know. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, who's got the answer key, uh, the scribe or Jesus? You are right, teacher, he says. See? Uh, that, that, yeah, that, he'll, he'll, he'll repent of that uh, later. He'll say, well, what, what was I thinking? I'm telling the Son of God <laughs> that he got the, he got the question right. Um, so, yeah, we, we don't grade God. He grades us. Um, but, but I'm glad you brought that up. Any more questions about, about that or anything that's come before? I think you've got it right, Pastor. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. Uh, but, but see, that, that's actually a good... Um, yeah, I, I'm a teacher. Jesus is more than. I mean, that, that's the problem. And, and I've pointed out how nearly every time in the, the Gospels, and especially the Gospel of Mark, when someone addresses him as teacher, it's nearly always a sign that his understanding is lacking in some way. Uh, the, the ones that get it right call him son of David, call him Lord, but, but not, not teacher, not, not rabbi. Or okay, uh, so th this next section is one that we all get the point of, but I want to take our time with it because I think we'll better appreciate it if we do. That it's kind of like the children's message. You always know the answer we're looking for is Jesus. <laughs> and, and, and we can say that. We can say that being on this side of Jesus having come, died, and risen, but the folks in the moment prior to the cross couldn't and, and want to see how radical a point Jesus is making and, and what a significant point it is about our salvation uh, that, that Jesus is making through this question that stumps his opponents. Uh, so I was thinking about this. It's kind of like um, we, we always got onto Annie when she was younger because on her math homework, she would just put the answer. So what, what, what are we going to do here? We're going to show our work, okay? Yes, the answer is Jesus, but we're going to show how we get there. And as Jesus taught in the temple, I've got to edit all this stuff out. A a a poor Annie, you know. <laughs> um, as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, how can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself and the Holy Spirit declared the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord, so how is he his son? And the great throng heard him gladly. So he's still in the temple, and he brings up the scribes. That's the last group he dealt with. He dealt with one of the scribes. How can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of, the da uh, son of David. First of all, who are the scribes? 
They're, they're the copyists of the law. They know the law better than anybody else because it's their job to copy it letter by letter in hand, by hand. Um, what, 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 what would we say, you know, hearing that question? How can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? Answer is? Because he is. <laughs> That's what the Bible says. That's what the scriptures say. But what, what are the scriptures saying when they say that? What does it mean, the Christ? Who's the Christ? What's the Christ? Okay, Messiah. Messiah. Um, so Christ... Okay, this is the discard pile. Christ is the Greek version of what gets translated into English from the Hebrew as Messiah. So this is just the Greek version of the Hebrew Mashiach. Mashiach okay, uh, Christos. You know the the um, let's see. You all recognize this? Okay. So th this is first and last letters of Christos, Christ in Greek. Jesus Christos, Christos. Christ in Greek is the way the Greeks translated Messiah. What's a Messiah? What does Messiah mean? Anointed one. Anointed one. So who's an anointed one? What kind of person is an anointed one? A king. The kings are anointed ones. Remember how Samuel anointed Saul. He poured oil on his head, and the symbolism is that uh, you, a blessing is being poured into you from God and being poured onto your head, seat of wisdom. Kings need wisdom to rule, and therefore God's pouring his wisdom into you at your anointing so that you begin on a good foot, uh, on the right foot as, as, a, as a king, when Saul disappointed the Lord, Samuel turned around and anointed David. One of, one of the promises to David, remember when David decided he was going to build a, a, a home for the Lord, a house for the Lord, that he thought it just a, a, a disgrace that he, here he, David, was in this this magnificent palace, but the Lord was still living in a tent, the, the tabernacle from the days of Moses. And so David was going to build a house for, for, for God. And what did God say about that? He wouldn't build it because David was, what, what was the problem with David building it? He's a warrior. And so who is going to get to build it? Solomon, because he would be a king of peace. Nevertheless, in the context of that promise of there being a house for the Lord, the temple, what, what did God promise David? Yeah, that there, there would be someone to reign on the throne, okay, forever. Forever. Now, there, there are a couple of ways to take that. What do you think David heard that to mean? If, if you're in David's shoes and God promises you that, that uh, someone in your line will reign forever, what does forever mean there? What does that look like, that promise? How does the fulfillment of that promise look? They would never die. Who, who would never die? David's, this, this person. If they're going to reign forever, it means they would never die. They would sit on the throne forever. Now, Rob, are you saying that because that's what you would really have thought? Or are you saying that because we live this many years after Jesus came and died and rose? That's what I would, if, if somebody told me someone in my line was going to do something forever, well, rationally, I know that's not going to happen. But if, if someone was selling that to me, Yes. I would say, no, they were not going to do that forever because they're going to die. That's what I would. Okay. Think. All right. So, so then, how could that possibly be fulfilled? Let's see. Yeah, the person, the person, the person, the person, the person. 
Yeah, there, there will always be a descendant. Yeah, the lineage will never die out. And so, yeah, David's going to die, and then Solomon after him, but there's always going to be a son of a son of a son of a son, so that there's always a son of David on the throne, forever in that sense. And yet, there hasn't been for quite a while when Jesus says this. We've got a king of Israel, let's, let's say from David around 1000 BC, roughly, until when? When's the last king of Israel? Five eighty six, when, when Nebuchadnezzar conquers, conquers Jerusalem. So you you you've you've pretty much had no king for about as long as you had one, a Davidic king. You you, you had one from a thousand to five eighty six, but you haven't had one from five eighty six until now. Uh, that that's one of the things that that many have suggested is going on with Matthew's genealogy, by the way. If you want to, want to look at that real quick. Matthew's genealogy. You know, the, the, the stuff we, we love to hear in church, the begats <laughs> and all those, those names. Um, but w one of the features of Matthew's ordering or, uh, of, of the... Of, of the names is that you, you've got this nice, neat um, set of 14s. It, it's like um, from, from, you know, in, in your Bibles, you, you've got it done as, as paragraphs, right? But, but starting in, I, I think from two, verse 2 to uh, the first half of 6, you, you've got like 14. And then it's another 14, and then it's another 14. But, but, but here, here's, here's the point, is that from, from David until, look at verse 11. What, what's, what's the milestone? The time of the deportation to Babylon. You've got 14 guys. And then from the deportation to now, you've got 14 guys. And, and, and what, what's the point? What, what's the expectation that this is setting up? We go from king, no king, Jesus. Guess what Jesus must be? Complete the pattern, everybody. You know, it's a pattern problem. Okay? King, no king, what's next? King. King. Um, could that be Matthew's way of showing even at the beginning of, of Matthew uh, the, the fulfillment of this riddle that, that Jesus puts to the scribes. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> so we're in Matthew chap Mark chapter 12, verse 35 and following. It is a smile. It is a beaming smile behind that mask. I know it. Ah. <laughs> uh, the um, so the Christ, the Christ is the anointed one. The Christ is expected to be a king, but as we just said, the expectation was probably that when God had told David that there would be a son of David on the throne forever, it was forever in the sense of always. There will always be some descendant of David, and yet there hadn't been since five eighty six. So Jesus is going to teach us that forever means forever. There's going to be a guy, a son of David, who's going to take the throne, and he, that one, is going to hold it forever. You, 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 see, what I'm, you see how radical this must have been to the Israelites first hearing it? They, they, they can't possibly process this. That, of course, when God told David there would always be a descendant on the throne forever, that that meant, like we said, there, there would be a guy that would live after the, 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 the previous guy, and then a guy after that, then a guy after that. That's what forever means. And Jesus is here to tell them, God didn't lie. When he made that promise, he had every intention of keeping it. 
but you've misheard the promise. Because if the promise means what you think it meant, it's already been broken. Uh, I, I know he perhaps justly gets censured for his, his last writings about the Jews, Martin Luther, but earlier in his career he wrote several tracts about witnessing to the Jews, persuading them that Christ is, is, is the fulfillment of their scriptures. And this is a big deal to him, is that, that how, how, other, how else is this promise fulfilled? If, if you believe the scriptures as you pious Jews should, then you've got to admit that this promise hasn't been kept, but it has. Let me tell you about Jesus. Now this, this was a, a way of starting the conversation. Um, sure. Yeah. How would the Jew of that time kind of reconcile that promise with the lack of a king? For yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think one way would be to say, okay, we, we, we've still got kings, right? They just haven't been allowed to rule because of the, the governments we're oppressed by. But, but the line is still there just waiting for, for, for the opportunity to present itself for, for, for that one to rule again. And, and I think, isn't that going on like with the Maccabees? Uh, I, I'd have to uh, do, 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 do my, my research on like the Hasmonean revolt and, and all that stuff. But uh, I, I think that's part of it. But then, w w whether you know, or is it one of those things where we'll just forget that was said, yeah. right? You know, there's a lot of stuff in, 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 in the Old Testament, and so we, we just want to highlight that one, right? Um, or, remember, God also in that same context said, if, if, if you fall away, you, you will be punished. And, and so it's like he had a... Had a he had a clause in there to take it back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but at the very least, for our purposes now, to recognize that Messiah, when we hear Messiah as Christians, what, what do we immediately think as a synonym? Savior. 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 They did not, or, or to the extent that they would say, yeah, the Messiah is a Savior, but a Savior in the sense of a king saving his people from their political and military oppression. That's what they associate with the anointed one, with, with the word Messiah, the Christ. And more a savior, just their people, not necessarily. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. It's not a universal savior. That's right. That's right. He's come to save them. Now, let's go back to where this passage that Jesus quotes comes from. Anybody know the psalm that he's quoting? Karen, Grant, you're not allowed to answer because you've already had this uh, lecture last week. This may be the most significant psalm to the New Testament. With, with, with Psalm 118 be a being a close second. Psalm 118, the one about the, the, the stone the builders have rejected has become the, the head of the corner. That one, which also has, um, this is the day the Lord has made, let us rejoice and be glad in it. But what psalm does... The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet come from. Well, it's David's psalm, but I don't know the number. Okay, it, it is a psalm of David. 110. 110. Yeah, we got to know 110. All right, go to Psalm 110. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, spends about two or three chapters on this. That's, that's how important Psalm 110 by itself is. And it's not a long psalm. Mm -hmm. Psalm 110, and we'll, we'll just read it. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Get it? We, we, we've got, I mean, this is kingly language. This is what kings do. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power and holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. 
He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. There's Psalm 110. And the part that the book of Hebrews really fastens to is the, the bit about uh, you're a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Remember that? You remember this Melchizedek fellow? Who's Melchizedek? This goes back to Genesis. Very, very mysterious. Yeah, very mysterious figure. So uh, Abraham's just won a victorious uh, battle, uh, beat up on these kings, and now what happens? Melchizedek shows up. And what, is, what does Abraham do? Yeah, gives him a tenth. Gives him, of, of the spoils, he's just won from the battle. And what does Melchizedek do? Melchizedek is a priest, it says. He's the king of Salem. Salem means peace. Shalom, same consonants as shalom, peace. Doesn't that say he has no father and no mother? Yeah, yeah, that's what Hebrews points out. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But Melchizedek, he gives... Bread and wine. Yeah, bread and wine. Huh. Who does that? <laughs> Who gives bread and wine to... This, and, and then he leaves. He's out of there. And, and so this is one of those interesting passages in, in, in the Bible that the rabbis over all those years puzzled over because that's it. That's all we've got on Melchizedek. He just shows up. He has no beginning. He has no end. And yet he's important enough that he's in this psalm where you'll be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And what does the author of Hebrews say about this? He says, aha, see, you who think Jesus can't possibly be a high priest because he's not a Levite, a Levitical priest, well, yeah, he's not a Levite. He's greater than a Levite. He's after the order of Melchizedek. And he points out that Melchizedek is clearly higher than the Levites who came later in that the Levites paid him a tithe. How so? Well, Abraham did, and the Levites were in Abraham's loins. They weren't born yet, but they were, as it were, through Abraham paying Melchizedek a tithe. So obviously Melchizedek is higher, superior to the Levites, but he also, like Christ, has no beginning, has no end. He is eternal. In, in that sense, as far as we know in the scriptures, he just, he just shows up. There's, he doesn't show up in a genealogy. He's the son of so-and-so, and, -so, and we, we never hear about his death. And so it's, it's a foreshadowing of Christ himself. Christ is not a Levitical priest. He's a Melchizedek priest. Psalm 110 told us that ahead of time. But, but Jesus is concentrating on the very first words here where it says, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. Who's saying these words? God the Father. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Mm -hmm. Show your work. <laughs> We're showing our work this class. We're not just giving the answer. For all the years before Jesus came along and interpreted this for us, what would the answer be to the question, who's, who's saying those words? David. David. David is saying those words. It's a psalm of David. And David says, the Lord said to my Lord. Now, much of the scholarship about this particular psalm suggests that there were psalms like this among other cultures. Psalms in which, not necessarily psalms, but, but writings in which you have a king passing on the throne, the scepter, to the son. And, and it reads just like that, doesn't it? This, this is, this is the, the handing over of the reins, or the handing over of the reign, I should say. Um, and, and, and David takes that language and says, hey, that's pretty good. I know by the Holy Spirit what's going to happen in the future, 
And that's a perfect way of describing what, what that's going to be like. Now, Jesus comes along and says, okay, you've, you've all thought of it as that way. Explain exactly how that works in the way David's worded it. The Lord said to my Lord. Well, who, who's, who's the first Lord? Yeah, but what, 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 what would they think? God talking to, but, but David's writing it while he's king. Saul's out of the picture. Who, who's the king? David is. So who should be talking? Who should be handing over the reign? David to his son, right? Mm -hmm. And yet the one he's handing over the reign to, he calls his what? his Lord. Hmm. That's odd. W w w which is it? Is, is he David's son? Or is he David's Lord? Yeah. Now do you, yeah, that's the right answer. The answer is yes. But, but do you see that's, that's what the Pharisees are experiencing. I mean, it, what, what do they call it? Cognitive dissonance. That's what they're going through when Jesus puts, they, they knew this psalm like the back of their hand. Psalm 110 is huge, hugely significant. And yet, they, they had never really thought it through that the way we understood this psalm makes no sense. That how can David be talking about his own future descendant as his Lord? Because that's what he's doing. Moreover, look in your, your English translations. They help with this. How is... The, the first Lord in the verse, uh, let's say, um, capitalized. What, what do you got? In your English translations, the Lord, what, what, what's, what's kind of strange about the way Lord is written there? It's all caps. It's all caps. We, we've gone over this in, in classes before. What is that telling you in your English translations about the word in the Hebrew behind this? When it's in all caps, what is that? What, what, what's the word behind Lord here? Yahweh. Yahweh, God's name, God's actual name, Yahweh. The, the name that God revealed to Moses back in Exodus uh, chapter 6 in the burning bush, the, Yahweh. And, and you know all this, that in, in Hebrew, you've just got consonants. There, there, there aren't vowels. Jewish scribes later on decided, well, people are going to forget how to pronounce these words. So they came up with a pointing system and they put, you know, little dots and, 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 and dashes and stuff to indicate a, uh, a, uh, a, e, those sounds in between the consonants. But, but they're not in the original text. The original text is just consonants, and it's all uppercase. There's no upper and lower. It's just uppercase consonants. And, and so what, um, what, what the scribes would do whenever they came across God's name in order to keep the second commandment, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, which they interpreted to mean don't ever use it. Don't ever use it. Well, what, do we, what happens when we're reading along, even out loud, a verse that has God's name in it? So what they did is they put the vowels that belong to this word around the consonants for God's name. What's Adonai mean? It's more of a title. It's, it's Lord. Lord. So, so the, the second Lord in the verse is Adonai. Adonai E, my Lord. All right. Uh, I'm losing you. I'm losing you. So, <laughs> clear. Get the defibrillators. <laughs> uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the short of this, we've, we've gone over this before, is that in, in the Middle Ages, you, you, you had people reading the Bible who, who, who didn't know the Hebrew that well, and they certainly didn't know the, the, the Hebrew pointing system that well. And lo and behold, 
they, they came across these vowels around the word, the, the, around the letters for Yahweh, and, and they read it straight. And what do you get? You get Yehovah. Jehovah. Jehovah isn't a thing. It's a misunderstanding of what's going on because the scribes, what they wanted you to do here is when you saw the vowels for Adonai around Yahweh, they wanted you to say Adonai, not Yahweh. But the, the people in the Middle Ages, they didn't know that was what was going on. And so they combined the two in a way they were never meant to be combined to come up with Jehovah, which isn't even really a, a, a thing. So that'll shock your Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> you know, spring that on them while you turn up the raise the thermostat. That's what my grandpa always did. He'd say, come on in. He'd be out working in the yard. They'd come in their suits. <laughs> He'd set the thermostat for 86. They didn't, the visits were much shorter for him than they were for other, other, his neighbors. So sad. Okay, um, but uh, it, it, it's interesting, too, that in, in the modern, a modern Jewish translation, a modern English Jewish translation, you, you know what you're going to have for, the, for that psalm? You're going to have the name. The name said to my Lord. That, that, that's how it reads. No, I, I, I don't even think it's that. I don't even think it's, I think it's to my master. The, the name said to my master. Why do they translate it that way? A couple of reasons. One, they're always going to go with the, the most unchristian translation. They're going to go out of their way to translate it so that it doesn't lead to Jesus. That's part of it. But the other part is that, see, they're, they're going to avoid at all costs saying God's name here. They're, they're, they're telling you the name is at this place, but, but don't say it. And that, that, that's, that's the actual translation of that verse in the modern Jewish English Bible. Uh, but the Lord says to my Lord, now, how does that help us? We now know that the Lord at the beginning is God himself, the name of God. He says to my Lord, it's David speaking. So is he talking to David's son? Yes, he is. But is he also talking to David's Lord? Yes, he is. And that's what Jesus is pushing his, his hearers to recognize. That the Messiah, the one that they, in a sense, rightly recognize as the coming king, is a king, but an entirely different way than you're thinking about kings. He's the Son of God, come to bring salvation, not just uh, a, a kingly rule over a particular physical territory for a particular group of people. He's come to bring salvation for everyone that will last forever. And this is how this one can take the throne and hold it forever because he's not just a mortal descendant of David. He's the Son of God. He's David's Lord. It, it, it's, the, it's a paradox. And, and salvation for us takes place in paradoxes. The baby that is dependent on Mary's milk is also Mary's creator. See, the, the, the immortal God dies on the cross. The eternal God dies so that we who are mortal may have eternal life. Paradox. Uh, just last week, this is why Karen and, and Grant are hearing this for the second time, in the new member class, th this is a perfect place to take people in, in showing them why Jesus had to be both man and God. If he were only a man, then, and, and let's say a sinless man, the best he can do is save himself. If he's only God, and the problem is humanity, humanity is what has ruined everything, then what he does doesn't, doesn't do anything about the cause of the problem. It's humanity's guilt that must be dealt with. But if he's God and man, he can both stand in humanity's place and answer for humanity's guilt and offer a sacrifice that because he's God is of infinite worth, infinite value. 
He can cancel out as many sins as there ever are because he's God. He's infinite. He's without end, without limit. You see, I love that, that image of the, the scale and, and, you know, put all the sins of all the world, past, present, and future on, on one side of the scale. And what does God come and do? He plops down on the other end and those sins go flying. Thank God we have a fat God. <laughs> An infinite God that more than cancels out all the sin of the world. But, but, but that's how, see, salvation doesn't work otherwise. If you have only a man as a Savior or only God as a Savior, you're still in your sins. And, and that's Jesus' way of, of, of getting at that, uh, showing them that the point was already being made in the Old Testament 500 years ago in Psalm 110. All right, any questions about that? So, Pastor, if I were to restate it back to you saying, God the Father said to God the Son. Yeah, exactly. Yes, 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 yes. The Lord sort of, so he's saying uh, God, God, God the Father said to my Lord, who would be Jesus. But, but calling him my Lord, for David to call him my Lord, in, in those two words, in the, that, that combination of words, He's saying, this one is the God-man, because he is my son. He should be lower than me. You know, who, who, who is greater in the relationship, father or son? Father, of course. And yet, this one is the father's Lord. How can that be? Because he's both. He's both David's son and David's Lord. Don't you think, it's, you see what I meant by, by showing our work and how it pays to do that, to, to reach that insight, versus just, we, we know the answer, it, it, because he's Jesus, because Jesus is both, no, put yourself in the shoes of those who heard this for the first time, and, and you, you realize first what a shock this must come, come as to them, uh, but, but then also the, the great insight it gives us into the necessity of our Savior being both divine and human. All right. Um, I always, oh, t two things that, that, that this, this makes a perfect time to, to, to say. Um, first, some of you know what, uh, we all know Luther's last spoken word, I think, was yes. It was yes. Because, uh, you know, someone asked him, you know, do, do you, you know, remain steadfast to, 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 the, to the gospel that you taught and preached? And, and yes was the fast, last spoken word. But last written word. Do you know what, what, what the last written word of... He was, he was, he was always writing, you know, always on something. Beggars. Yeah, no. yes, we are all beggars. We are all beggars. But it comes at the end of, of several paragraphs where Luther is saying uh, things along this line. Uh, to appreciate Virgil, one must have been... Uh, you know, what, what, what one must work as a farmer or a shepherd for 10 years. Right? You, you can't really appreciate the, the kinds of things Virgil's talking about in his poetry unless you yourself have worked as a shepherd like he did. Um, but, uh, you know, he, he, he gives a, a few other, like, secular examples, right? To appreciate this famous king, you too would have to have ruled for 20 years, right? That, to, to, to make the point that it, it's miraculous. I mean, have you ever thought about this? If you think Jesus is just a human being, what, what, he was a carpenter's son. Who knows the Bible this well? You, you see that? You, you know, likewise, you could say about John the Baptist or Paul, right? Now, now Paul was educated but it didn't take him long to, to be exposed to Christ before he, he's, he's connecting all the dots. You know, he didn't have to go to seminary like the rest of us dummies. Um, that, that, that kind of thing. This is another one of those proofs for his divinity. That, that no one, that, that, that you, I think that's what Luther says. You know, you know, one would have to have studied the scriptures for 50 years to, to, to have the kind of insight that, that Jesus taught with. Anyway, okay. Uh, let's see. And the, the fact that in verse 37, we have the great throng heard him gladly. Uh, last time, that's going to happen in Mark. 
uh, the, the, the crowd isn't gonna, gonna hear him gladly after this. Now, fasten your seatbelts. I think, didn't I warn you about this? Gonna rock your world when we talk about the widow's might. Here we go. And in his teaching he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Now I'm going to keep going. We're going to come back to that, but there's a point in, in keeping going. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. All right. Um, let's first start with beware of the scribes. This, by the way, is um, parallel to Matthew and Luke, where you have this extended woe. You know, woe to the scribes and you know, woe to the hypocrites, and on and on and on. You know, whitewashed tombs and and things like that, uh, placing burdens uh, on on others that they themselves can't can't bear, and that that kind of thing. So this is kind of the pocket version of of what Matthew and Luke gives us. But uh, what, what what's the issue here? What what about the scribes? They're hypocrites. They're hypocrites. How so? Well, they kind of said they ask others things that they would not do. Kind of opposite. Yeah, uh, but let's look at what Jesus actually cites here. They put themselves ahead of others? Okay. They dress in fancy clothes. They have the best seats. They yes. They take from the poor. Take. Yeah. Ah, who devour widows' houses, and for a pretense, make long prayers. What's a pretense? A show. Yeah. Yeah. You know, an ex a, a, you know, a reason that isn't sincere, you know, something like that, right? Uh, so, you know, look at me showing off. You know, they've got these, these, these prayer shawls to make it look like they're constantly in prayer. Um, and, and remember, who are the Pharisees and who are the scribes for the most part who are aligned with the Pharisees? Because like the Pharisees, they take the law seriously. They, they were preachers and teachers. And, and they were, let's give them their due, exemplary in holiness. Okay? Um, but, but as they go about living their holy lives, uh, they like to flaunt it. Make sure you know about it. Make sure you know about it. Okay? Um, and, and so Jesus clear, is clearly accusing them of, of self-promotion. They're, they're all about wealth and honor. Um, and... The fact is, in Jesus' day, the non-Pharisees would have looked up to them. I mean, and, and let's face it, we can relate to this. Why do the televangelists do so well? I mean, the, the average person looks on them as a holy person, as doing the Lord's work. And, and so, you know, money just keeps pouring in. And so it's not just one private jet they get, they get two. I just want one. <laughs> That's all I ask, you know. Um, uh, what, 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 else, what else about? We can relate to the Pharisees of Jesus' day in this way. What, what else is attractive about? 
an Oral Roberts or a Joel Osteen or. But if you do the same thing, you. All right, that message of, of name it, claim it, or prosperity gospel, that's true. But what about them personally? I mean, I, I would imagine many of us, if not all of us, look on them, see through them, or, or you know, assume that it's, it's a racket, that kind of thing. But a whole bunch of people don't see it that way. A whole bunch of people look up to them and give them a lot of their resources. Again, why? What, what, what about them? Charisma. Charisma. Also they persuade people. Yes. Lean towards the yeah, there's certainly that message that you're going to get something out of given to me. That's right. That's right. Um, but. Uh, Yes, ex ex exactly. Yeah, that's right. You, you, you look on the life of a, a Joel Osteen and you say, you know, here is a kind, gentle, prayerful man. You know, I, I, he, he's worth my sacrifice to continue to spread this message that, that he's spreading. I mean, just look at him. You know, what a, you know, he's obviously saintly, that kind of thing. And, and, and that's how the Pharisees would have been perceived by most of Jesus' audience. But Jesus also knows the hearts of these Pharisees. And so he says, here's what it's really about for them. Um, now, I, I think the kind of, kind of our best way of, of this text getting to our hearts is, is to recognize this. Jesus calls them hypocrites. What, what's a hypocrite? Says one, thing, does the other. Says one thing, does another. Now, when you imagine a hypocrite, does the hypocrite know, know what he's doing? I, I think our, the, the conventional version of a hypocrite is yes. That, that, that's part of why we get so mad. Because he knows this is wrong and he's doing it anyway. But there's another kind of hypocrite. There's the hypocrite that doesn't know he's one. You, you see what I mean? So, so let's take the quintessential example of, of a hypocrite. The, the man that prays in the temple, I thank you, Lord, that, that you, you, I'm not like that sinner back there, that you have made me better than him. It, when he prays those words, is he sincere? Yes, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't think he's praying those words thinking, I know this is a bad thing to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> no, he really thinks that. And, and he's really grateful that God has made him a good person unlike that bad person back there. Can we not fall into that? As Christians, can we not be hypocrites in that same way? That, that we think we're, we're even being humble about it. I'm only as good as I am because God, God enabled me to be so. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> no, but seriously. And, and, and we, we, we hear it in others far better than we hear it in ourselves. But, but be self-critical about your thoughts and your attitudes towards others. That, that how often... We're always judging. We're always thinking in terms of, you know, th you know that, that person is so much worse than I am. And, and, and then, then we'll, you know, oh, that's a terrible thought. That's a terrible thought. And, and so I'll, I'll make up for it by, Lord, thank you for your grace that I'm not as bad as that person. <laughs> Hypocrites. Hypocrites. And, and then we're very pleased for people to see our righteousness, to see our holiness, the way the... The Pharisees loved to, to be seen as holy, holy, right? Um, we're out of time, but keep all that in mind because that is the immediate context for what Jesus is going to say about the widow. And 
the question is this. We all know, we all have our view of the widow's might and the widow and the might. And what's it about? She gave everything. She gave everything. She gave everything, right? And, and, and so what, what, what are we supposed to, what lesson are we supposed to take from that? Go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. Yeah. And I'm telling you, It, 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 it's, it's likely just the opposite. What, what, what's he saying? He's just gotten done saying one of the grievous errors of the or faults or vices of the Pharisees is they devour widows' houses. And then now we have an example of it. This widow is being devoured by these Pharisees who make her give all to the treasury box. Whereas they just take the cream off the top of their income you know, doesn't even mean anything to them. He's not commending the widow. He's saying, don't, don't be like the widow and give everything you have. No, stop listening to the Pharisees who are a bunch of hypocrites destroying your life for nothing. Maybe, maybe. And the very next thing is, the disciples saying, look at all these pretty buildings. <laughs> you know, they're still looking at things from the outside. And Jesus is saying, stop looking at the outside. Stop giving your money to this terrible temple operation. Right? It's a different way of hearing it, isn't it? Yeah. And, and, and so, because I've, I've always been bothered by, and now, now uh, there's still something to be said for the widow and, and her faith and so forth, but, but if, if, you take, if you go all the way, if it is a go and do likewise, then I should be telling you every week, stop paying your, stop wasting money on your electricity, give it to the church. And now we're right back to the televangelists. Only the televangelists have got the widow's might right. No, 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 that's devouring the widow's house, taking their livelihood away from them. And that's why you, you've never heard me preach a, you must give 10% kind of sermon. Yeah, Ray, I'm sorry. Uh, it's time for you. Yes, yes, I know. But I've already been. All right. So long, everybody. Thanks for calling the, calling the clock. <laughs>